but that video certainly got me sort of in the mood. Um, if anybody doesn't know me, my name is Ricky. I'm married to Naomi, who you've just met. Uh, and along with our one-year-old daughter, Gabriella, we've been part of the church family here for about two and a half years now. Um, and it's my privilege this morning to continue this series on Alive. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the encounters that people had with the resurrected Jesus and the profound impact that that had on their lives. And the incredible thing is that 2,000 years later and 2,000 miles away from where the resurrection took place, the same thing is possible for us today. Now, maybe you think that sounds a little bit crazy this morning, but bear with me. And I want to start by telling you something about me this morning. And unless you know me really, really well, you won't know this, because I spend an awful lot of my time and energy trying to hide this from people. But I think it's only fair and right that I tell you this morning. I struggle with nerves. I have done for as long as I can remember. And although there have been times in my life when it's got a little bit better, it's something that's never gone away. Um, And one of the things that triggers my nerves, believe it or not, is performing or speaking in public. I know that sounds strange hearing me say that on stage this morning, but it's true. And I... I have this really clear memory of being in primary school. I must have been nine years old, and I had quite a big part in the school play. And I was super pumped, and I loved learning my lines and practicing. I was in my element. And then the day came when I had to perform. I had to stand up in front of the entire school and play my part. And my nerves kicked in. And I can remember having the school music teacher sat with me for, it felt like hours on end, trying to get me to calm down. She had me laying down on the floor. I was trying to breathe through my diaphragm. I still can't tell you where my diaphragm is or how on earth you breathe through it, but she tried her best. But nothing worked. The the darkness descended and all I could think about was how nervous I was. But the problem was, this performance was getting closer and closer. No matter what I did, it was coming. And so I went out there, and I sort of nervously stumbled my way through my first couple of lines, and then I was like, ah, I'm doing it. And it actually went quite well. I haven't won any Oscars yet, but there's still time. Now, maybe you think that doesn't sound that big. It just sounds small, ah, it's nothing. Okay, fair enough. Maybe you don't struggle with nerves. Maybe nerves isn't your thing. Maybe for you it's anxieties or or stress or depression, or constant worrying about something. But I'm confident that whatever it might be, most of us in this room can probably recall a time when we've experienced something like this. And in those times, it doesn't feel small and insignificant. It feels real, and it feels big, and it's the only thing you can see. And in those moments, it can feel like we've lost our sense of peace. What is peace, is the natural question to ask. Well, let me tell you, as a father of a one-year-old, I'm not talking about peace and quiet, because I get very little of that. I'm talking about a sense or a feeling or being in a state where you're confident that either everything is okay or everything's going to be okay. doesn't mean you're not going through something, but whatever you're going through feels normal. You will get through this. We will reach the other side. I'll give you an example. If I cut my hand, I'm not going to do it live on stage, don't worry. If I cut my hand, I bleed. I'm human, so I bleed, right? And it hurts. I feel the pain. The pain is there. The repercussions of what's happened is there. But I don't worry about it. It's just a cut, right? My hand's going to heal. It's going to stop bleeding. Fine, I might get a scar, but my hand will be okay. But for me, when my nerves kick in, I can't see past that. I cannot see that there's a time in the future when this is going to be okay. All I can see is what's in front of me. And it's huge. And whatever it might be for you, whenever that happens, whenever that thing kicks in, it wears you down and it can leave you feeling inadequate or incomplete maybe insufficient, your confidence can be knocked, your well-being isn't as it's meant to be. 
And at times, it can leave you asking some quite fundamental questions of yourself and of the world around you. That's not a nice place to be in. So let me ask you a question. How are you doing? How are you really doing this morning? Take a moment and think about that. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask anybody to come on stage and tell me what they're going through. But just be honest with yourself. Where are you at this morning? Are you in a good place? Sun's shining, feels warm, everything's good. You've got some meat on the barbecue, perhaps. It's a good day. Or are you in a dark place? Is there something in your life right now that just isn't quite right? And whatever it is, it's just eating away at you. If that's you this morning, I just want to tell you that you are not alone. You're definitely not alone. A study by the Mental Health Foundation in 2018 found that in the preceding 12 months, 74% of adults had felt so stressed or overwhelmed that they felt they were unable to cope. 74%. 32% of adults in the preceding 12 months had experienced suicidal thoughts. And that 16% had actually self-harmed. Now, I don't know about you, but those percentages are staggering. That's a lot higher than I would have thought. And that's pre-COVID. So, who knows what those numbers would be like now. And then last year, a a workplace health report found that 53% of of men and 65% of women were, in that moment, experiencing some sort of anxiety, feeling anxious about something. And that 50% of men and 60% of women were experiencing some symptoms of depression. Again, much higher percentages than I would have expected. Or then young people. A study found that one in five young people are suffering from a probable mental disorder. Now look, these are studies, right? These are small samples that are taken and you extrapolate the data and you try and come up with some kind of idea of what that number might be for the population. So is there some level of error in these? Probably. But what's clear to me is that the mental health, the mental well-being crisis that we face is real. It is bigger than we think And it is not going away. So let me ask you again. How are you doing? We've cleared all the noise. We've cleared all the busyness from the slide now. All that's gone. How are you doing? Where are you really at this morning? Because see, our well-being is quite a complex, multifaceted topic. It's a little bit like having a car. But your car's got multiple different fuel tanks. I'm not talking about hybrid where the petrol engine recharges the battery, all that fancy stuff. You've got several different fuel tanks, and if you don't keep all of those fuel tanks topped up, your car will break down. You imagine that. You had seven different petrol stations you have to go to. You'd have to go sort of every day of the week, wouldn't you? It would be like never-ending topping up with fuel. And if you had those different fuel tanks, you might have fuel tanks that look a little bit like this. You've got physical, emotional, spiritual, relational, financial, vocational. There's just six there, but you could add more to that list. And this is the reality of what our well-being is like. We have all of these things that we have to stay on top of. And so it's quite fragile, and it's quite a challenge to, to stay topped up in each of these areas. And like I said, the moment is, that the, the fact is that the moment one of these six things slips... The moment that one of them gets too low, you can be left feeling like something's missing, like you're incomplete in one of these areas. You're not how you should be. So if we've got all of these different fuel tanks to stay on top of, how on earth are we supposed to do that? How on earth are we supposed to find peace and stay topped up? Well, the good news is we are not the first people to ask this question. You see, the Bible has an awful lot to say about peace. In fact, I think even more than that, for me, I think peace is a core thread that runs throughout the entire Bible story. So let me ask the question again, what is peace? 
Well, the Hebrew word for peace, the original word that would have been used in our Bibles when we read the word peace, particularly in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is shalom. Now, shalom is a really exciting word, right? Peace doesn't really do it justice because shalom is not just about the absence of conflict. And if, like me, you woke up this morning and saw the news of Iran's retaliation and everything that's going on in the Middle East or the crisis in Russia and the Ukraine, like, how on earth are we? We can't even find peace in that area. Like, how are we going to ever reach shalom? It's not just about an absence of conflict. It's about being complete, about being whole, about being without a blemish. So, for example, you could say that this, this stone here is perfectly round, perfectly spherical, doesn't have any dents, any cracks in it. It's, it's complete, it's how it should be. You could describe the stone as being shalom. So when we think about our well-being through that lens, through being complete, not just a, an absence of conflict or anything else like that, what does that mean? Well, I believe that God has a plan for you to enjoy peace. And I think those two words are key. It's not experience peace. It's not no peace. It's to enjoy peace. God's plan for you is that you would be in a state of peace and that you would enjoy that. And when God is at work in your life, when God is moving in your life, I believe you can know that. You can have that peace. You can, you can enjoy shalom despite the difficulties. Because trust me, they won't go away. The difficulties, the challenges of life, they're going to come and come and come. But God's plan is that you would enjoy peace even when everything around you isn't. Let me share an example from a time when Jesus' closest followers were experiencing anything but peace. So we carry on the series. We're just after the Easter story. We're in the Gospel of John. And this is our passage. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So first things, the disciples are together in a house with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Like they're scared. They've just seen their leader arrested, accused, falsely found to be uh, guilty, and brutally murdered in front of them. Right? They are terrified that the Jewish leaders are going to try and do exactly the same thing to them. But I think there's more than fear in this room. I think there's a whole heap of guilt in this room as well. Right? How is Peter feeling right now? He's deserted Jesus. He's denied knowing Jesus three times. And now he's in this house as well. Scared, yeah? But probably also feeling quite guilty. And into this melting pot of emotion, into this sort of crisis, Jesus came and stood among them. Jesus appears. How does a dead man appear in a locked house? I think that's the question that the disciples ask themselves, right? They see Jesus in the house and they're like, what is going on? And Jesus starts by saying, peace be with you. Shalom. Now I think at this point, this is just a greeting. It's a fairly standard greeting in those times to say peace when you meet someone. I don't think there's anything more in this right now, but we'll come back to that later on. But then once he said that, once once he greets them... He shows them his hands and his sides. How you first read that, you think that's quite a weird thing to do. I kind of go, hello. But actually, again, I think what happens here, a little bit like what Chris talked about last week, I think Jesus appears, and at first, the disciples aren't sure who he is. Like, they're asking themselves, have we seen a ghost? Am I hallucinating? Is this some sort of vision that I've got? Like, a dead man can't appear in a locked building. This, this doesn't happen. And so I think when Jesus shows them his hands and his sides, he's saying, look, it's me. I am resurrected. I'm here. 
And then we read, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And so I think at this point, they realize who Jesus is. And what happens at the moment they realize who Jesus is? They're overjoyed. And I think the same thing can happen for us. Right? We might not, be, we're not, might not physically be in a locked house, but emotionally we might be in a locked house. We're carrying all this stuff. We've closed ourselves off from the world. Right? We, we've gone into survival mode. We're just shut down. Despite the fears, worries, the anxieties that we may have, Jesus can step into that situation. He can come and be where you are. And if we see him, if we realize who he is, I think we can have this transforming experience. In this moment here, the Jewish leaders don't stop pursuing the disciples. Right? The, the circumstances they have, the thing that's causing their fear is still real. But what Jesus has done in this moment is he's met them in their fear and suddenly they're overjoyed. Their perspective of the situation they're in has changed. Circumstance has not changed. Perspective has changed. But that's just, that's just the start of the story. Let's see what happens next. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And so this time Jesus says, peace be with you again. I think this time it means something more. I don't think Jesus is saying hello for a second time. Right? I think this time he's reinforcing that message. I'm here to bring peace. Peace be with you. But he doesn't just say that. He says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And you see here things start to get a little bit active. right? Because now that Jesus brings a task, Jesus, Jesus asks something of them. What does that mean? As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Well, I think the obvious answer is to look at the life of Jesus. What, what did Jesus do? Well, preceding his crucifixion, he spent the, a few years before that traveling around the region meeting people, going to where they were, and oftentimes meeting them in, in real need, physical need, emotional need, and, and he connects with people. And he performs these miracles. He heals people. He brings sight back to the blind. He brings dead people back to life. And a little bit earlier in the Gospel of John, we read this, these words of Jesus. I have come that they may know life and have it to the full. What was Jesus' life about? I think it's summed up here. He came that they may know life and have it to the full. Life to the full, life that's complete, life as it's supposed to be. Shalom. Jesus came to bring shalom. And that's what he's asking of the disciples. And what happens next? Well, if you, you carry on the story, you, you read into the book of Acts, you see that the disciples go out and they start to do this stuff. And suddenly, poor old Peter, afraid Peter, guilty Peter, he's suddenly renewed. Right? And he has this, I don't know, confidence and bravery around him. You read a few chapters on, and instead of hiding from the Jewish leaders, he stands before them and he speaks to them. And this is the transforming power that comes from this encounter with the risen Jesus. But what are we supposed to do? Right? Because he... If this is what Jesus is asking the disciples to do, he's asking us as his followers to do the same thing. Now, as I said, you've just met my wife, Naomi, who is the uh, community team coordinator, I think is the correct title here. So it wasn't too difficult for me to find out what we do as a church in this area. So we cook meals for people that are unable to cook meals for themselves for whatever reason. We were hugely blessed when Gabriella was born. It was brilliant. It's like every day at four o'clock, the doorbell would ring. And uh, someone in this church makes the best sticky toffee pudding, but you'll have to find out for yourself who that is. 
Um, we also have a partnership with Share, our sort of food sharing charity. Um, again, sort of distributing food to people that are facing food poverty for whatever reason. And, and actually, Naomi was explaining to me, it's not just about feeding them. It's not just about giving them food. It's about trying to strip away the impact that not being able to eat properly has on their life, on their physical well-being. But then that has a knock-on impact on their emotional well-being. And they have to go to work tired, hungry, stressed. And what does that do? And so it's about trying to strip back some of those things. We have also sourced a bike for some teenagers that needed a bike. We've given baby boxes to new parents. We've gotten hold of ear defenders for a young person with autism that has to take the bus to school, and that's a challenge. Um, I think we're working on some welcome packs for new people moving into the community. Um, and as you've heard about friends, the friendship table, it's about creating safe spaces for people to come and, and, and meet each other and... Um, and things like that. And there's also the, re the relationship with Kaleidoscopic UK, the domestic abuse charity that we support. And these may all sound like practical things, but I think it's about restoring people and restoring their belief in themselves to see themselves the way that God sees them, to help them see themselves as valued, loved, cared for individuals. And I think that's what Jesus is asking of the disciples. So what has Jesus done? Well, he's come and he's met the disciples in their fear. He's filled them with joy and he's empowered them to share that. So maybe you're asking, well, what about me? Oh, that's a good question to ask. How do I enjoy this peace? What do I need to do to know this? Well, what did the disciples do? Jesus appeared. That was the first thing. Jesus showed the hands and sides. Like I said, for me, I think that is Jesus trying to show who he really is. Look, you can see the hole where the nail went through. You can see the scar in my side where they stabbed me. It is me. And then the disciples believed that it was Jesus. They recognized Jesus. And they were filled with joy. I think it's as simple as that. The only thing you have to do is to believe who Jesus is, that he is the son of God, that he came down to earth, that he died on that cross for you to make a way to pay for the sin and to reconcile your relationship with God. Can you believe that? Simple, right? If only. See, naturally, at some point in time, these things creep back in and we can be left with doubt. You can question if you believe, if you ever believed in the first place. And so what happens then? Well, thankfully, again, we're not alone. You see, we read earlier about the disciples, but actually one of them wasn't there. Thomas wasn't there. And uh, Thomas is a bit infamous, can I say? Poor old Thomas, doubting Thomas, you may have heard him called. Poor Thomas wasn't there. He missed out on this experience. And so what his friends do, as you would, they go, oh, Thomas, you won't believe what happened. We were in the, in the house and we were together and Jesus was there. And Thomas is like, oh yeah, 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 sounds great. And this is what Thomas actually says. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side... I will not believe. Fair enough. Fair enough. After everything that Thomas has seen in the last week, I can understand this. I get it. And this is a little bit of my story. See, I didn't grow up in the church. I had no real encounter with faith growing up. And then as I got older, I met some people that did. And they told me their story. They shared their experience with me. Our first thought was nonsense. But I listened a little bit more. And then I, I gained a little bit of an interest. But my stumbling block was the same as Thomas. I was not willing to base my life on something that somebody else had experienced. Unless I experienced it for myself, I refused to believe. 
And I found exactly the same thing as Thomas. Let's take a look. A week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out, and put your hand, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. After everything that Jesus has been through, you could understand if at this point Jesus says, what more do you want from me, Thomas? What more do you want me to do for you? But that's not what Jesus does. He's patient. He's gentle. He's kind. He meets Thomas where he's at. And the same was true for me. You probably guessed in into the story, seeing as I'm stood here, but... um, Over several months, I asked more questions. I got more answers. I had more doubts. I asked more questions. I refused to believe what I had heard, and I demanded more and more proof. Until I found myself tagging along to a Christian conference in a field in Somerset. And um, one evening, the person on stage was, was asking people to respond to what they'd heard. And I'm there with all this doubt and refusing to believe. And in that moment, I just heard God say to me, now is your time to come to me. And I'm like, you what? There's 3,000 people in this tent. And you want me now? I think when, when that happens to you, you only have one option. So with like shaky legs like this, I get up, make my way to the front. And, um, and in that moment, my response was similar to Thomas. My Lord and my God, I believe. Are you in that place this morning? Have you asked question after question? Have you demanded more and more proof? Have you refused to accept what you've seen, what you've heard, and what you've experienced? Like Thomas, are your doubts destroying your peace? See, God helped Thomas to doubt his doubts and to respond with, my Lord and my God. And that was the gateway for Thomas to experience peace. I think there comes a time when enough is enough and you've seen enough, you've, you've asked enough, you've wondered enough, you've doubted enough and this has gone on for too long. There comes a, comes a time when you just need to stop doubting and believe. Have you spent too long asking questions, <laughs> wanting more answers, proof? Is Jesus telling you this morning to stop doubting and believe? God has a plan for you to enjoy peace. And to bring about his plan, God was willing to come down to earth and to die on that cross. It was the only way that he could make a way for us to know reconciliation with him and enjoy this peace. But as we've seen over the last few weeks, Jesus didn't stay dead. Jesus was resurrected and he appeared to Mary, to the two people on the way to Emmaus last week, to the disciples and Thomas this week, and we've got a couple more weeks of this series to come. And again, 2,000 years later and 2,000 miles away from where all of this took place, we can still encounter the risen Christ and experience that peace. Has the time come to stop doubting and believe? So what? So what? What difference does all of this make? Why should you care? It doesn't make life simple. It doesn't take away the challenges, the struggles, the fears. A whole bunch of that stuff's still going to come. Sometimes even more. The circumstances of your life won't change. But your perspective will. You won't enjoy the difficult times. But somehow in them, you'll find this odd sense of peace. You'll develop an understanding that the challenges and the struggles that you face, however big they may be, they are temporary. God is in control. God has a plan. And his plan is for you to enjoy peace. To not be defined by your fears. To know that this isn't the end. Even after death, it's not the end. We get to spend eternity enjoying peace with God. 
to encounter this joy, be filled with this joy, knowing who God is and knowing who we are before him. And to be empowered to share this peace with others, to meet their physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. This isn't a gift we're supposed to hold on to tightly, but we're supposed to share it with everybody around us. We're supposed to see others the way that God sees them. And how do we experience this? Faith. Is God calling you into that this morning? 